Hello! Welcome to another video from me, your ever-exciting ecclesiastical historian, Matthew Hoskin. In my last video, I talked about late antiquity as an exciting period in the history of the Roman Empire as it transitions from existing to not existing, or at least the Western Roman Empire does, as the world goes from classical to post-classical, and we end up in something medieval or Byzantine by the end of it. Um, and so now, of course, this is mostly supposed to be a channel about ecclesiastical history, the history of Christianity, the history of the church, the person's beliefs, and all of that that go on there. So I figured, well, let's talk about Christianity in late antiquity. This is a thing I do know a thing or two about. Um, most of the books here are about either late antiquity or uh, Christianity in late antiquity. Those shelves there. There are also medieval, medieval books there. You may notice Medieval Callings by Jacques Le Goff there. Um, as well as, of course, we have here a replica mosaic of the mosaic of Christ, well, they think it might be Christ, from um, Hinton St. Mary in Dorset. The original is in the British Museum, I can assure you. I'm not um, in breaking into the British Museum and stealing famous artifacts from them. Um, you can buy reproductions in the gift shop. So, of course, most of my other icons are not late antique, in case you were curious to know. They are mosaics from Hagia Sophia in Constantinople from what we call the Byzantine or in Middle Ages, as well as some frescoes that are also of a similar medieval period or even later things, although Jerome Bosch is kind of medieval. So, late antiquity, a thing I can talk about. Christianity in late antiquity, a thing I can talk about. And what's the big story here? I think the big overarching story, the thing that sort of influences all of the things that are going on, is um, the transformation of, of Christianity within the Mediterranean world from an ignored, a largely ignored and at times persecuted um, religious sect to the official majority religion of the Roman Empire. So, late antiquity, as I established for the purposes of these videos, I chose the sort of 234 to 641 dates. And so when this period opens, we are in the age of two guys called Origen and Hippolytus, um, one of them, one of the most famous and influential theologians of the ancient church. The other one, um, potentially highly influential, but more enigmatic. A lot of texts attributed to him um, are doubtfully his. Um, some of them, even things like his apostolic tradition of Hippolytus, was this actually by Hippolytus or by someone else of a different name or by no one, because it's a traditional text. Um, or the refutation of all heresies, Hippolytus or Anonymous. Or... Oh, anti-pope. Hippolytus or not? Not an anti-pope, as it turns out, uh, if you ask me. But of course, uh, other people will disagree, which is part of the fun of academic stuff. So, and Origen, on the other hand, sort of the teacher of the fathers. You can find an icon of Origen as the one who teaches the church fathers. And he is sort of the person who really takes up the teaching mantle of Philo, the Jewish teacher in Alexandria, and then Clement, the Christian teacher in Alexandria, and then Origen himself in Alexandria, um, going deep down into the allegorical exegesis of sacred scripture. But of course, unlike Philo, but like um, his teacher Clement, Origen is all about finding Christ in the depths of the beauty of the scriptures. And he has a deep mystical theology um, that is wedded to this. And he's the guy who sets the church on, who sort of forces her to start thinking even more deeply and thoroughly about questions such as the Trinity um, and sort of sorting through the unanswered things or the threads left open by origin is one of the things that will lead to the Arian crisis or Nicene crisis of the fourth century, which is to say you don't need Constantine to have theological controversy. So that is sort of the moment that we open in. Um, as so some estimate that in the 250s, there are only about 2% of the Roman Empire is Christian, um, which is not a lot. This is, of course, I mentioned that period of political unrest when things look like they're coming apart everywhere. And in 250 comes the first formal attempt by an emperor to attempt an empire-wide um, organized persecution by a guy called Decius. And then after him, another one comes along under the Emperor Valerian in the later 250s. Um, under that persecution, St. Cyprian of Carthage dies, one of um, our early Latin theologians. So that's what's going on there. Valerian himself... Um, however, ends up being captured by the uh, Persian Emperor Shapur I in the year 260, and his successor Gallienus, in fact, makes Christianity legal, and it enjoys its legal status for the next 40 years. Um, and over that 40 years of um, 
sort of safety, the church grows to an estimated 10% of the Roman population, which some see as being one of the reasons why Diocletian in 303 or 304 starts launching a persecution um, because he's reestablishing Roman religion, reestablishing order to the empire. And all of a sudden he's freaking out because um, there's so many Christians around. There's even one who makes the sacrifice fail. So this and Diocletian, however, is the biggest, baddest persecution of them all. This is the one that is the actually most systematic, the one where the greatest number of people die or the greatest number of Christian scriptures are burned and the greatest number of people lapse. They either um, burn the incense to the emperor or hand over. They're a tradator, a hander over of the scriptures or all sorts of different things, right? Or you get someone to, of course, all sorts of questions arrive. You get someone to... Um, forge a document for you that says you committed the pagan sacrifice, is that itself a form of um, being a traitor or not? Different people have different answers. Um, so if you, you, you people come through this and the church basically sees itself now as the church of the martyrs, this is uh, how it sort of envisions itself that in the true orthodoxy, unlike perhaps the Valentinian Gnostics, is um, itself um, the faith of those who suffered and died for Christ. Um, and so that means that everyone else needs to be cut off from the church, maybe. This is a question that had arisen in the 250s uh, after Decius and again after Valerian. Um, and it arises again in the early 300s. So these identity forming events for the Christian faith are going on right now. And people are trying to figure out um, what you do with these people. And this sort of starts to fragment actually the church itself as some hardline rigorists, um, some who had existed since the 250s, the Novationists, um, and some who are newborn in the, four, in the fourth century, the Donatists in North Africa, Novationists from Rome, Donatists from North Africa, continue to exist. Um, you wouldn't, Novationists, you could say, continue to coexist with uh, the local church Catholic. Donatists, you would say, um, continue to be a thorn in the side of the local church Catholic for a century until the imperial, um, the weight of imperial force comes down upon them and they start getting disinherited, having property confiscated from them and facing all sorts of legal problems. So, but this last persecution is a big deal and Constantine comes um, in 306 and then 312, he is a Christian and he conquers the entire Western empire and he and Licinius together sort of make, um, restore the, the 50 year old um, resolution to make Christianity legal, and but with Constantine himself a Christian, it also starts to enter into a favored status. And so if you think about that, and you think if you read Eusebius' account of the martyrs of Palestine, you can sort of see why this guy is what some consider a sellout, that you'd probably sell out too if you lived through what he did and then saw the peace of the church that Constantine was able to establish. Um, so that's just to say we shouldn't be quite as hard on Eusebius as many people are because, quite frankly, none of us have had to suffer through what he had to suffer through and see what he saw, um, such as his great mentor and teacher, Pamphilus, being martyred. So, um, but what this means, this Constantinian moment, um, there are lots of things that this means. Um, very few of them have anything to do with what uh, people like Dan Brown will tell you, and almost none of them have anything to do with Gnosticism. Um but the biggest thing is that the institutions of church order and the institutions of empire are entwined. Look at a map. You may say, why Why are you holding a paper map? Because I hate video editing. So we look here. This is a map of the Roman Empire um, divided um, by Diocletian into its different prefectures, its uh, dio, dioicases and provinciae. And each of these, as it turns out, is also a division of the church as it exists throughout the Middle Ages, that the capital city of each of the smaller things is itself a city where there is a bishop, um, a metropolitan bishop. And so then that's just to show you the Roman Empire is a thing that influences, that's just sort of a basic structural thing, but these sorts of structural questions um, become important throughout late antiquity. So... So that's kind of a big story that's going on in late antiquity. Um, and so for ex and so Constantine, in fact, sets the pace for one of the biggest things that goes on, which is the calling of what we call ecumenical councils, of which there are seven, um, as recognized by the Orthodox Church. And I sort of count, I only think about seven as a result, um, even though obviously the Copts only have like three, um, the Coptic Orthodox Church, Armenian Apostolic Church, 
Ethiopian Tawahedo Orthodox Church, um, the so-called and the Syriac Orthodox Church only recognize three ecumenical councils, um, and the so-called the Church of the East, so-called Nestorians, don't really. They're like, oh, we like Nicaea. That was a good one. Oh, Constantinople one. That was a good church council too. But that's sort of. They're like maybe two. Not big fans of Ephesus. Um, so, but anyway, the majority Christians that you will um, encounter, Eastern Orthodox, which includes Greek, Russian, Ukrainian, Serbian, Romanian, Orthodox, um, Antiochian Orthodox, um, they embrace these seven ecumenical councils that are also embraced by the Roman Catholic Church, but the Roman Catholic Church um, plays a game in the Middle Ages that uh, I'm not getting into today because that's uh, more controversial than I feel like dealing with in the comments section for one thing and it's off topic for another. So seven ecumenical councils occur in the sort of the age of the ancient church. The last one in 787 so says pretty medieval Byzantine, kind of Carolingian in the West, it's the age of Charlemagne. Um, so, but those councils happen and they all of them happen. So this is the point that I was trying to drive at. They are all called by an emperor each of those seven councils is called by an emperor. Unlike the medieval ones, all called by popes. So there's a different game going on there than these ones up to the seventh. Are all called by emperors um, to deal with um, crises in the church's ability to articulate the faith. So the first one is a crisis. Um, and so that gets to, so that's just a story that I'm going to get into a moment. And it's an interesting story there. What I'm trying to say is that the em emperors are influencing the way the church governs herself and the way she operates and they are making the enforcement of ortho orthodoxy a real thing which impinges upon the life of the church within the empire in certain ways and outside of the empire in other ways so for example the persian church um, finds itself early on in the reign of constantine seems to have been persecuted to some degree we don't our sources are not super strong or reliable on how bad this persecution was but christians all of a sudden are suspect to the persian emperor because his rival is a christian so that's um, one result. Another result during the reign of Justinian, when there comes down a final anti-Nestorian uh, sort of stance, very strong, goes on there um, and think all the three chapters. Don't have to worry about that, what exactly is going on there. But what it means is that the people who are against, who are sort of supporters of the teaching of these, of Theodore of Mopsuestia, Diodor of Tarsus, um, basically either are forced to start to embrace um, the Council of Chalcedon, which is, and the Council of Ephesus, which are against Diodor and Tarsus, Diodor and Theodore, or they leave. And so then the Church of the East, within Persian territory and beyond, is itself sort of gaining this new flavor um, outside of the Roman Empire because of pressures from the Roman Empire. And it actually, at times, it never, it takes a long time to actually finally become truly Nestorian, though. It, it really resists um, a lot of the pressures and in, into the 600s, a lot of the pressures coming from more westerly places um, to embrace um, these teachings. And they really want to allow people to be at peace with one another, um, to be able to say that some of these Christological questions are actually um, partly a matter of language. And so if, if you're saying parsopa, what does that actually mean? Does Jesus have two parsopa or not? Can you say that? Is that heresy? And I do say parsopa because that's a Syriac word that comes from the Greek word prosopon, um, because it is heresy to the imperial church to say that Christ, says Christ has two prosopa because that means that he has two persons, which automatically sounds like a bit of a crazy thing to say in modern English. So the institutional church within the Roman Empire there causing waves and ripples elsewhere. And it's an interesting story. Um, and it influences all of these other things that are going on, but the questions of theology, of liturgy, and of the ascetic movement, which are the th uh, which are three things in evangelization, would continue on without Constantine and the Christianization of Europe. So, so I want to talk about three other stories quickly for the rest of this video. One, uh, the development of doctrine. Two, the history of the ascetic movement, and three, the evangelization of the Roman Empire and therefore Europe. Um, obviously, North Africa and Egypt are super important, as well as Asia Minor and um, the Levant. So they also get Christianized. Then they also get conquered by the House of Islam. So that's a bit of a, that's the tail end of antiquity. 
of late antiquity, in fact, is that story. We'll talk about that briefly under point three, which is evangelization. Point one, though, the development of doctrine. Um, the church, the crisis that emerges when Arius says there was when he was not, when Arius the presbyter in Alexandria says that there is a time when Jesus didn't exist, that he is simply the most exalted creature, um, and that by being begotten of the Father, he is not co-eternal with the Father. That crisis would have, that crisis arose naturally it was not engineered by any emperor and they councils had been meeting um previously um to deal with um major um doctrinal crises as had been going on since the mid 100s so to deal with this though all of a sudden with imperial favor they can actually do their best to, to get together as many bishops as they possibly can so this because this is like late antiquity is the age of the councils when they get together as many bishops as they can usually it's mostly bishops from the east and the they try to represent the entire oikumene the entire inhabited world of the romans in these councils and uh so they do this this at nicaea in 325 which is the most famous one um they do what there is another one in 381 in constantinople which is sort of after the fact recognized as having been an ecumenical council because it ends up being ratified by a bunch of people and treated as such by the Council of Chalcedon in 451. But before Chalcedon in 431, there's, there is a council at Ephesus. Um, and uh, so on, Chalcedon in 451, and then second Constantinople, 553, third council, Constantinople in 689, and then second Nicaea in 787. And um, you don't need to remember those things, but these are things that are going on. And what is going on is the refinement of how do we safely articulate um, this deposit of the tradition that has come from the apostles is found in the scriptures um, that the Orthodox writers of the ancient church, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus of Lyon, um, mo most of Clement of Alexandria, most of Origen of Alexandria, um, Tert most of Tertullian, um, St. Cyprian, um, the Trinitarian thought of novation um what are we going to do with these things what are we going to do with these um teachings and this deposit of faith how do we articulate it in a way that is both philosophically coherent although some would argue trinity is not those people are wrong they uh, in a way that is philosophically coherent on the one hand but also scripturally and traditionally faithful on the other that is what they're sorting through at the doctrinal level at these councils um, that is the doctrinal development of the church um and so one of these, the, the big thing for the sort of the first two is the question of Trinity. Um, and the sort of end result is being able to say that God exists um, as a single usia, a uh, single essence, who has three hypostases or three um, prosopa, three personae, so three persons in one God. Um, and there's a lot that goes on to be able to say that and a lot that goes into explaining what that means in the work of people like St. Gregory of Nazianzus and St. Gregory of Nyssa. So that's the Trinity. And then the the next ones deal with the question of Christology. Well, how is it that Jesus is fully God, but he's also human? He he dies a human death. Um, according to the scriptures, he um, has tasted everything we have, but without sin. So what does that mean? And so then that's what they deal with these Christological questions um, at Ephesus in 431, Chalcedon in 451, second Constantinople in 553, and... Um, Third Constantinople, 689. Those ones are really getting into those questions of Christology. How do you safely say this? And it's sort of this tension between Ephesus, which is about there's one person um, very strongly, this unity of the Christ, um, a hypostatic union, um, balanced by, but there are two natures, which is what they say at Chalcedon. Um, there are two natures that are united um, in the hypostatic union, the henosis kata hypostasin, uh, union according to hypostasis, hypostasis. And then um, you get into the fact that, but if they're two natures, how many wills do they have? And all of these things, and you sort of further refine how you can talk about this safely um, without compromising either the fullness of his divinity or the fullness of his humanity. Um, so this is the development of doctrine, and it would have happened, and it is what happened. Um, and the final one, 787, is about icons, which is actually, one would argue, the final flowing out of saying the fullness of the humanity of Christ means you can make pictures of him. And so then, that's not after it, but there. That is, there is a Byzantine icon. Um, these things are approved. There you can see Christ sitting on his first the throne he ever sat on, his mother's lap. So that's what those are about. This is these are these aren't the only doctrinal questions that emerge, but these are the ones that are the whole church gets agitated over and needs to call councils about. 
um, because the person of Jesus is the gospel, right? He is the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is himself. Salvation is through no other name under heaven but him. And so then this is the big deal is figuring out who he is and how he saves us. And what does this mean? The other development along the way is sort of, we might call it a formalization of asceticism. Um, Christian ascetic thought is ancient and definitely predates Constantine. Um, there are houses of consecrated virgins mentioned in St. Cyprian in the third century. And uh, what Eusebius imagines that this is a perfectly normal thing, that there will be both celibate men and celibate women who are part of the Christian community. Um, and Clement of setting aside the question of celibacy as well, Clement of Alexandria um, actually produces a strongly ascetic um, vision of what um, the ideal Christian life is, about moderation in terms of food and drink and living a simple life, wearing simple clothing, buying simple furniture, eating simple food, um, fasting regularly, and um, living a life of prayer in order that you can come through contemplation to the vision of the one true and living God. And so this is the ascetic movement. And um, all the Christianity of the cities, there becomes a certain amount of unrest um, amongst people who want to pursue holiness in a particularly powerful way in this sort of post-Constantinian settlement when all, you know, all of these aristocrats are becoming Christians living in their lavish palaces and some of these bishops are living in these fancy lavish ways as well. And so sort of as a protest movement within the church at one level, but not even a protest movement so much as um, a call to the rest of the church, a, a living icon of holiness, um, a bunch of guys move into places like the Egyptian desert, the Judean desert, the Syrian desert being sort of the hot spots for the origination of this, thus the Desert Fathers, um, people like St. Anthony of Egypt um, being chief, sort of the one of the chief go-getters. Um, and then Pacomius also in Egypt, sort of the first guy who gathers together a formal structured monastic house, a quinobium, with a rule to govern how they live, how they pray, um, and what their common life together looks like so and so this ascetic movement continues um and it gets sort of becomes sort of institutionalized and formalized um but a couple to it is also mysticism this sort of realization that these things that go on in our hearts and minds and spirits are not divorced from the disciplined life that we live in the body that uh you discipline the flesh in order to gain the body which i realize is sergey bulgakov but there it is for you um, Sergei Bulgakov, the famous Russian desert father from the late 19th century, of course. Um, but that's sort of what's going on there, that they're trying to rise up and find God. And so the famous names here are guys like Evagrius, who ends up finding himself, um, some of his more speculative theology gets condemned. But his sort of ascetic works, his works on prayer, these are priced highly by the church and get transmitted under other people's names sometimes. Um, survive in Armenian and Syriac as well, beyond the reach of the Roman imperial system and the imperial church, and often survive in Latin as well. And he has a student who's a guy named John Cassian, who is essential, who is essential reading in Latin monasticism. He writes in Latin, um, sort of in the 420s in Southern Gaul and Marseille, and he sort of recasts a Vagrian mysticism and asceticism into uh, the Latin language into a way that might be acceptable to the new orthodoxy. Um, and so he talks about purity of heart instead of apatheia. Apatheia being a thing with all sorts of stoic overtones that Christians don't like. But it being a central word to Evagrianism. And Cassian himself is a central reading for a guy named Benedict. And so St. Benedict um, of, of Nursia is, of course, the founder of what becomes a Benedictine order, which is itself actually just a federation of independent monasteries, um, full-blown monastic orders um, are a thing that emerge with Cistercians. But anyway, they follow the rule of Benedict, the Cistercians do. So you can see that the rule of St. Benedict with his organized ways of seeking um, the hours of prayer is a major, uh, major influencer for the rest of the history of Christian spirituality. Um, and the writings of the Benedictines later on, people like the venerable St. Bede, people like St. Anselm, people like St. Bernard, Cistercian, therefore Benedictine. Um, these are essential reading for um, oh, St. Hildegard von Bingen. Um, these are essential reading for us um, in the Latin West as our own spirituality develops and we seek Christ. And uh, alongside, uh, amongst these ascetics, of course, there's a guy named Patrick. 
Um, Christian asceticism is not just for monks, it's also for missionaries. And so there's this evangelization. I've talked about this sort of evangelization of the elites that's going on um, through the course of the 4th century to such a degree that when one of the laws of Theodosius II, and I think it's 427, if it's not that, it's 417, I forget. Um, he actually has, includes the phrase, pagans, if there are any. Sort of like this is a guy who has no clue, is anyone actually a pagan anymore? Everyone he knows is a professing Christian. Um, so that's just a thing to think about. That the Roman Empire is slowly, you have the elites being converted, and then the, the lower class people, um, the people either the urban poor as well as the people of the countryside are also themselves um, becoming Christian or Christianized, evangelized over the course of these centuries as well. Um, as people like Caesarius of Arles realize, feel that perhaps the things that the local constituents of um, their diocese are getting up to out in the countryside are not actually um, in accordance with historic Christian practice and may actually be just leftover mm -hmm. bits of pagan superstition. And so then this sort of evangelization, this sort of going deeper um, for seeking after a true holiness that is bound to the Christian gospel um, is part of sort of the penetration of, of Christianity um, deeper into Europe and the Mediterranean more widely. But then you also have missionary endeavors going beyond the boundaries of Europe. Uh, well, no, sorry, of the Roman Empire, like Ireland, which is Europe still. Um, so like Patrick goes to Ireland and then from in, in the 400s and then in the 500s, um, St. Columba goes from Ireland to Scotland to Pict. Pictland. Um, and so you see these movements of missionaries going around in the year 597, still within our period. Um, St. Gregory, Bishop of Rome, sends a guy named Augustine to Kent to the pagan English to convert them. And so that's sort of St. Augustine of Canterbury is the start of English Christianity. So once again, part of this sort of period that we're going up to 641 and you can see evangelization of the barbarians is a thing that's going on. Um, it's a thing that was going on before Constantine II, of course. It's also worth worth pointing out that, you know, this 2% to 10% is a thing. Um, people like Gregory Thaumaturgos, who brought the gospel to Cappadocia in the Anti-Nicene period, as well as St. Gregory the Illuminator, who brought the gospel to Armenia. And in fact, the king of Armenia is the first Christian monarch, setting aside Abgar of Edessa, who that's probably a fictional story. So the first historically attested um, Christian monarch is a king of Armenia, whose name escapes me at the moment because I forgot to put him in my notes, which, which are really sparse anyway. So you have this Christianization, but what's happening at the end of antiquity is um, the rise of Islam and conquest of large portions of the Eastern Roman Empire, as well as the fall of the Sassanian Persian dynasty, and therefore the Persian Empire entirely falls. Um, and so then it's sort of there may have, there were, there, we know that there were Christians, we should say, we know there were Christians in Arabia. Christians in late antiquity um, established and brought a greater setting, greater quantity of um, Christians and Christian organization and missionary impulse to Ethiopia. Um, you have to be careful about how you phrase the history of Ethiopia. So I'm not saying there were no Christians before it got organized with bishops, but I think that the organization of the church there certainly helped the spread of the faith throughout the Ethiopian people, and Ethiopia becomes a Christian empire um, for the next for millennia as a result of what goes on in late antiquity. And so you also have Christians in Yemen, which is just right across from Ethiopia, and you have Christians throughout the Middle East bringing the gospel with them wherever they go, except in a completely different circumstance, right? These missionaries go out um, to places that aren't part of the Roman Empire, they're part of the Persian Empire, or part of other polities further east, and then eventually places that will come under um, the House of Islam. And that's also going on in late antiquity. So that's just, those are like sort of three of the stories besides the big, the sort of big story that interpenetrates everything of going from persecution to official majority religion, um, is, are also these stories of the development of doctrine and the historical shape that takes is influenced by these, but it's something that would happen anyway. The story of asceticism is also influenced by these, but it's a thing that would happen in some form anyway. Um, and then evangelization is a thing that would always have continued. But of course, the formal acceptance Christianization of Europe is a thing that went on much more quickly as a result of the Constantinian settlement and the imperial church. So those are sorts of big, broad overviews. There are lots and lots of people that who you didn't hear about. You're like, why wasn't Augustine of Hippo brought up? Isn't he super famous? What about St. Athanasius of Alexandria? Cyril of Alexandria? 
what about them? Aren't they important? They're all important, super important people. Um, there's just not enough time. But let me tell you, if Christianity and late antiquity interests you super a lot, I am teaching a course starting in January with Davin and Hall, where I'm going to talk specifically about the historical context of the seven ecumenical councils. So stay tuned uh, for more about that. Once this, I will make sure that I put a link in the description to how you could in fact register for that course even now. And that's all for today. Have a nice day.